welcome back. So we are looking at John chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Last week, we finished up the wedding at Cana. And one of the things that we have seen already in John is the passage of the old in favor of the new, beginning with John the Baptist. Actually, earlier than that, really. Because didn't we also start off with another telling of in the beginning? Yeah, it's, it's been a few weeks, but <laughs> yeah, John starts off the same way Genesis does in the beginning. However, this telling is dealing with the person of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. And then we encounter John the Baptist. John is the one foretold in the Old Testament as the forerunner, the one who will come before Jesus to prepare his way. But he will give way to Jesus. John will even say of himself, I must decrease, but he must increase. And so John drops off. This isn't the last we've seen of John. We'll see him again when he's in prison. But... His importance to the story is critical. He's the one preparing the way for Jesus. But now that Jesus has come, the need for John the Baptist is diminished. Right? He is something pointing to something that will come after him. At the wedding at Cana, Jesus will make wine of water. And now, we're going to talk about the temple. The temple is, as we've discussed uh, in, first and second, uh, in, in First Kings, the temple is preparatory. The temple is in place pointing to something that will come after itself. The word for this, something that points to something that, that comes after itself, and this is a word that's extremely important in John. Is the word sign. A sign points to something greater than itself. The sign is not the climactic thing. You don't take your kids to Orlando and then stand beside the Welcome to Disney World sign, take the picture, and go home, right? And yet, in it, that would be cruel. Don't do it. That's, but that's exactly what it's like with people who, who try to repristinate the temple apart from Jesus or to interpret the temple without Jesus, which is exactly what we're going to run into. So let's open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you have told us that your body is itself the temple. We thank you for your sacrifice of atonement, for being truly the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Pour out your Spirit upon us through your word according to your promise, that we may see you and, like your disciples, believe in you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's begin with, cha uh, with chapter 2 beginning at verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Uh, why does it say they go down to Capernaum? Well, he wasn't in Jerusalem. Yeah, Capernaum's actually below sea level. It's, it's on the shores of Lake Gennesaret which is to say it is in Galilee. What do we know about Galilee? Well, it's where Jesus grows up. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, but then, of course, the Holy Family has to escape to Egypt. Out of Egypt, the father calls his son, 
And according to the prophecy, he shall be a Nazarene. He grows up in the city of Nazareth. Nazareth is in Galilee. That's Gentile territory. You have all kinds of people that live there. Uh, the Romans are building extravagant cities. Many of the Jews who live up there work on those cities. And as we know, uh, St. Joseph was poor. We know this because when they go to the temple, they offer a dove. That's the permitted sacrifice if you're not rich enough for a lamb. And Jesus works with Joseph. Um, some, we, we call him a carpenter, and that's, that's fine. Uh, but the word kind of has a more broad meaning, like a contractor, a laborer, right? And so they could be working on Sephoris or, or Sephora, I forget the, the name of it, or Caesarea uh, Maritima, um, settlements that are being built, cities that are being built in and around Galilee. Galilee is the kind of place where no self-respecting Messiah would be caught dead. This is what, what Nathaniel says. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You expect the, the, the Savior to come from Jerusalem, right? Not from Nazareth. Uh, but in John's Gospel, Jesus is going to spend the bulk of his time in and around Jerusalem or in Judea. Uh, the synoptics show him a lot more in, in Galilee. Time-wise, Jesus does spend most of his time in Galilee, and some of the best confessions of faith he gets in Galilee. Again, from the places you don't expect. Canaanite women and centurions and when Jesus has encounters with the, the Jewish leadership, it doesn't go very well at all. The people that, that really should know him and receive him, those are the ones who don't, which is what John tells us at the beginning of his gospel. He came into his own, his own did not receive him, but to those who did receive him, he gave the right to become the children of God. But this is one of those times when Jesus is in Galilee, but he's on his way to Jerusalem. We get the idea that he, that he stops by um, Capernaum. Now this, this story, this, this account of the cleansing of the temple will begin and end with the Passover. When you just read the synoptics, and again the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, called that way because they're very similar to one another, whereas John is rather different. Uh, different not that it, it doesn't undo the story of the synoptics, but it tells accounts gives details that the others really don't have. And that's also true of this account. This account is found, I think it's in all four Gospels, but in each account, um, the synoptics are going to look very similar. John gives us details that the others don't, which is going to be helpful for us. In the synoptics, if you read through it, it, it it's not exactly certain how long Jesus was ministering. And by, by ministering, I don't mean that he's not ministering to you now. Obviously, he does but he does so from the right hand of God the Father. When we talk about Jesus' ministry, we're kind of talking about that period between his baptism and his ascension. When he's walking the earth as a man, he still is a man, by the way, he still has his body. He ascended into heaven as a man. When he returns, he will return bodily. He's raised from death as a man, as, as you will be as well. You'll be a human being when you're raised body and soul. Um, but when we talk about his ministry, we're talking about that period from his baptism where he is publicly identified as the Son of God up to his ascension where he returns to the Father. In the synoptics, it doesn't, it's not exactly certain how long that period is. But in John, John will describe Jesus celebrating the Passover three times. And for this reason, we know that he was 30 when he began his ministry and he's 33 when he's crucified. Begins his ministry at 30, three Passovers, that's three years, 33. Um, now, there is, there is a ton of intrigue in verse 12 about which word? Brothers. Yeah, he got it. Um, because there, there's always a question in the Bible about the nature of Jesus' brothers. Are these brothers from Joseph's earlier marriage where Joseph was an old man? Probably by this time, Joseph is, is dead. This is one of the reasons we think that Joseph might have been older when he married Mary. Um, maybe he was a widower. Maybe he had children from a previous marriage. 
Uh, the church has discussed in, in various ways this question of the nature of Jesus' brothers. Does, and it's usually framed as, as the question of Mary. We know that Mary is a virgin when she gives birth. Does she perpetually remain a virgin? All of the church fathers, Luther included, believe that Mary perpetually remained a virgin. The position of this class is that I don't care. <laughs> and the reason is twofold. One, it's such a red herring. I mean, literally, you know, red herring is the, 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 the hounds are on the trail of the fox and you take a stinky fish and you drag it across. And instead of chasing the fish, or instead of chasing the fox, they go after the fish, right? That's what a red herring is. It's so easy to get bogged down in this discussion. And the, and the, the simple fact is that on the one hand, the church fathers believe she remained a virgin, well and good. Um, but is it necessary for the faith to believe one way or the other? No. There's, there's always that question because brothers can have multiple meanings. I mean, in, in the Bible, brothers can mean cousins, but I don't, I'm not seeing it. I mean, it, it can be, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not convinced of it. The way that this is, the way that this account is told makes it very co clear that the central focus here is Jesus. Jesus is going, oh, and by the way, his mother, his brothers, and the disciples are with him. They're not unimportant. They are listed. But it's obvious that Jesus is the main character here. Jesus is the focus. He's going, and they're going with him. So there's, yeah, we had to discuss this sooner or later. The question is, um, in the synoptics, this account, or the, there is an account of the cleansing of the temple, and it comes during Holy Week. When, after Jesus enters triumphantly into Jerusalem, th that's when the synoptics place the cleansing of the temple. John places this at his first Passover. There are a couple of options as to how this works. One of them is that John, John does use markers of time, but time markers in John are elastic. In other words, if, if you're looking for a chronological account of Jesus' ministry, your go-to is Matthew. Matthew is very much this, then this, then this, then this, then this. Mark and Luke do that too, somewhat. John will sometimes group things thematically. And here, the, the beginning of John's gospel, there's very much a theme of old things are giving way to new. And that definitely fits here. It's also going to set the, the stage for what the temple is and, and Jesus' conflict with the Jews. So it could be that simply John is grouping things thematically like we do in the catechism, where we'll take the verses dealing with baptism and we'll put them all together, even though they're found in uh, Matthew and in Mark and in Titus. And, you know, that's one option. Another option is, is that he did it twice. That's certainly possible. Um, there's convincing arguments to be made either way. And um, I'm with Luther on this that you know what, there are some things that may just remain not completely known to us, and that's fine. <laughs> because either one of those is certainly possible, and it, and it doesn't undo the gospel at all. It, it doesn't go, aha, see, I told you the Bible was wrong. It doesn't do that at all. John does sometimes group things thematically, and it is entirely possible and doesn't undo this. It's possible that Jesus cleanses the temple twice. And either one is fine. Yes. Um, I'm not, I'm not strictly a Luther scholar, so, so to know exactly when, I don't know, or, or how it changed. He still held the Blessed Virgin in very high regard, as did the reformers after him, so that, for example, in the Formula of Concord, um, we state that Lutherans not only may, but must acknowledge Mary not only as the mother of Jesus, but in fact as the mother of God. Now, that does not mean that Mary made God, it's a confession that the baby in her womb is God in the flesh. So even calling Mary the mother of God is a confession of Jesus' divinity. In other words, we're, we're preserving it not so much for the, the sake of the Blessed Virgin, although she is. It's, it's even there, it's a confession of Jesus.
but we do call her the mother of God. Yeah, Gabriel says from this time on, all generations will call her blessed, and so do we. We don't pray to her. No, we don't pray to her, and we don't, we don't call her the mediatrix of all graces or the queen of heaven, but we do confess she is the mother of Jesus, who is God, and therefore the mother of God. And she's named in the creed, and unlike Pontius Pilate, she's favorably named in the creed. <laughs> So his stop in Capernaum is, it, it looks brief in John, it might be. Um, the, the, the other Gospels will have a lot more to say about his time in Capernaum, but again, he could have been to Capernaum more than once. Uh, he's, this is kind of a base of operations for him in Galilee, and a place where he tends to be very well received. Okay, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And again, up to Jerusalem is geography. Jerusalem's on a hill on Mount Zion, formerly Moriah, right? The place where Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed, Mount Moriah. Uh, Mount Zion, where David built the city. Still there, uh, still there today, um, though the temple is not. Uh, but John introduces this with the Passover. And so by telling you this, and again, as, as we said, there's a really good chance this gospel was designed to be read in the synagogues to the, to the Jews uh, as the gospel went out from Jerusalem. That word Passover is supposed to cause you to bring all of that baggage into your mind. The idea that God himself calls Israel out of Egypt. He delivers them from oppression. He, um, he's going to, to curse the Egyptians with the death of the firstborn, but by the blood of the lamb, he saves the, the sons of Israel, right? So... Bring all of that with you. Also the idea that there will be continuing sacrifices and continuing meals in, in relation to the Passover. Verse 14. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all, all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Yeah, there's a lot there. So first of all, Jesus walks into the temple. What attitude does Jesus assume when he gets to the temple? He acts like he owns the place. <laughs> yeah, right. He does. This is the thing. The temple is built to and for the living God. And as John tells us at the very beginning of the gospel, Jesus is the living God in the flesh. So Jesus comes to the temple, and here, which is not like how he is in many other things in the gospels, uh, he doesn't come in humility, he comes in judgment. He comes in power. He goes to the temple and he, and he treats it like he owns the place. Now, that doesn't mean it's, he's careless with it or reckless with it. It actually means he has great care for what goes on there and he's interested that what goes on there be right. Yeah, that, that's ex it's, it's wonderful how the Lord does this because on Wednesday we were just talking about the inauguration of the temple and all the sacrifices that go on and people would bring out of their own flocks and their own herds to come and present the sacrifice to the temple. It's a big deal to walk a sheep to Jerusalem if you don't live right next door. But that's what they did. The, the, the Jews were expected to go to the temple three times a year. Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Booths. And for Passover, they're supposed to bring a sacrifice, right? And as, as we mentioned, um, the lamb would be presented to the priest. The priest would, would examine it for blemishes. And then the man who brought the sheep would, would, would kill it, present it to the priests. They would take it up to the altar. They would process it, butcher it. They would take the breast on the right thigh, wave it, uh, wave the breast at the altar, and the, that would be the priest's meat. The rest of the sacrifice would go back to the one who brought it, and he, he would eat it. He would share it with his family and with anyone who happened to be around him. So there was exemption made, for example, for the poor. The poor did not have to bring a sheep. They could bring a dove or a pigeon, right? And 
that's not a lot of a meal. But if there's a family sitting beside you and they have a lamb, that's probably more than a meal for their family. They share, right? So it's intended to be a communal meal for the people of Israel. And in that way, God provides for all of them. He strengthens their bonds together as a people, as a nation. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, at, at Passover, right. You, you share with the family, the children, the slaves, all of them partake. Yeah. And, yeah, great. Um, so Jesus knows how it's supposed to go. But what does he see? Well, put yourself in the shoes of a Galilean peasant, right? You're a peasant from Galilee, and you have to walk this lamb all the way down to Jerusalem, or rather up to Jerusalem, south to Jerusalem. And you finally get there with this lamb, and you took very good care to make sure that the lamb was what? Without blemish, because the priest would examine the sacrifice before you killed it. And if there's a blemish, the priest says no. You can't sacrifice that one. So you bring the sacrifice up all the way to Jerusalem. You get there. You made sure there's no blemishes. You're very careful to make sure that the dumb animal doesn't break its leg on the way down, uh, does, doesn't get stuck in thorns and get all cut up. Um, sheep require a lot of attention because they're not... Their, their instinct for self-preservation is not finely honed. We'll put it that way. Um, and... It's no wonder the, the, the Bible calls us sheep all the time, right? <laughs> but you finally get there, and the priest goes, uh, it's like when you bring a car in for a trade-in, right? They find everything you didn't, whether it was there or not. You know, ah, oh, you know, uh, that looks like a blemish to me, you know. Uh, whether it is or it's not, the priest will say, nope, um, but you can go buy one over there. And these... These helpful merchants are set up in the temple, in the courtyard, and they have their own sacrifices that you can buy from them. Well, you know, uh, of the market, you know, during Passover, the prices are going to be very inflated, but you can't buy it with your dirty money. If you're Galilean, you can't use filthy Gentile money. No, no, no. You have to exchange it for the Tyrian shekel. And of course, there's an exchange rate, which is very favorable, right? It's it's like us today. You can't do a transaction with there being, without there being like three middlemen who take a cut of that transaction every time you move money. It's ridiculous. So the exchange rate is going to favor the sellers. The price is going to favor the sellers. Would not shock me if the priest was getting a cut. So then you buy their sacrifice, and then you can sacrifice it. And this is going on, right? And in the synoptics, um, it's not... It's, it's not quite as clear in John, but in the synoptics, Jesus doesn't just say a house of trade, he says a den of robbers. Indicating it's, it's, part of the problem is that there is business going on in the temple, but in addition, there's also usury. That is, those in positions of power and wealth are taking advantage of the poor, or even just the traveler. Right. Thing is, what, Okay, um, let's, let's say the church has a bake sale. And let's say you pay $50 for a pie. Are you buying $50 for a pie because you're being taken advantage of or because you want to help the youth group? Right, right. Um, like I said, in, in the synoptics, it makes it clear that the, a lot of the problem is that they're taking advantage of the situation, right? They're taking advantage of their people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always something to be cautious of in the church. Uh, which, which is why we tend to be kind of cautious about, um, about business within the church. We, we generally don't do it. Not, it's not an absolute. I mean, we've, we've had sales to benefit the youth group. We've had sales to benefit, you know, if there's a, a sister who, who needs uh, help financially, um, we'll raise money that way. But, it, but yeah, that, that's always something to be cautious of. Um, Let's go to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14, 21. Whenever we go to the minor prophets, there's a lot of flipping. That's okay. Uh, yeah, Zechariah 14, 21.
almost at the very end of the Old Testament. Zechariah 14.21. Yep. Very last verse of Zechariah. I guess you could, could turn to Malachi 1.1 1, 1 and just back up a verse. That would work. <laughs> And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. So there's, there's prophecy here at the, at the very end of Zechariah that there's coming a day when there will not be traitors in the house of the Lord. In other words, where the, the temple will be purified of this kind of thing. Uh, now turn to Psalm 69, verse 9. I think this is one of those that is not in the hymnal. I will continue to gripe about that. Psalm 69, verse 9. Not unimportant is the fact this is a psalm of David. We're told that specifically. After all, what does David have to do with the temple? Right. <laughs> he wanted to build it. Um, I'm going to back up a couple of verses back to 6. Psalm 69, 6. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. What does that have to do with the cleansing of the temple? Well, look at verse 17. Uh, let's go back to John 2, 17. I didn't know I was going to have to turn the Bible pages in Bible study. I know. <laughs> now, um, John 2.17, we are told that his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. I do wonder exactly when they remembered that. I tend to think that happened after the resurrection. It tends to be that his disciples don't really see things clearly at all until Jesus is raised from the dead. And now everything starts to make sense to them. Um, at the end of Luke, Jesus is talking with the disciples on their way to Emmaus. He opens the scriptures to them. Um, and Peter says, Jesus, I'm not, I'm not going to let you go to the cross. You know, we're going to fight our way out of this. In fact, at Gethsemane, Peter draws the sword. He doesn't understand until the resurrection what was supposed to, to be done to and by the Christ. Um, but a couple things going on in, in verse 15, when Jesus walks into the temple, notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't stand there and go, man, someone ought to do something. He's someone and he does something. 
which is to say he, he doesn't merely speak about it. He acts. This is indicative of how the Christ is going to be. He will preach a lot. Um, he'll have discourses in this gospel that will go on for three chapters. But understand, he, is, he does not only speak, he acts. Which is important because our salvation is based upon his action. That is, that, that he suffers and he dies. Really, that he permits things to be done to him. And he's risen from the dead. In other words, he's, he's not just a, a guru, right? A, a person you go to for some wisdom who just walked around saying things but didn't really act. Oh, yeah, the temple really shouldn't be like that. You know, if, if I were running the temple, I would do things differently. He's a man of action. Yeah, and, and again, these are to be signs. The actions are signs that point forward to a greater reality. And so the temple is to be the place where God dwells with his people and God's people sacrifice to him. And what's going on here is that it's now its own economy. Are you doing it now, Malachi 3? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want to do it now? Let's go to Malachi 3. Malachi 3.14, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. So God accepting the, the sacrifices of J Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to him. It means that there will be a time when it is not. And Jesus coming into the temple, that's what's going on. As we learned with Cain and Abel, you can make sacrifices, but without, without faith, it doesn't please God. In fact, we're told in Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So there are sacrifices being made in the temple, but when they are when they're done apart from faith, when they are uh, tainted with theft and usury and um, taking advantage of people, um, that's not pleasing to the Lord. So the prophecy in Malachi is that there will come a time when the sacrifices will once again be pleasing to the Lord. Why don't I write down, oh, that's my handwriting. I, I thought it was Malachi 3.14. I wrote down Malachi 3, 1 through 4. Well, I can't read my handwriting. Woo. So the prophecy is that the Lord himself will come to the temple. And when he comes, he comes how? Suddenly. That's how it happens in John. There's no announcement. There's no preparation. He just goes. There he is. And what does he do? Now, I, I want us to note this too as well because we're very prone to emotionalize and psychologize uh, when we read the Bible, which is very dangerous territory. But this is not Jesus snapping. This is not Jesus losing control of himself. First of all, he has to go out of the temple 
find the stuff to make a whip of quartz, and then come back. This is planned. This is thoughtful. He didn't have to carry it like Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, he, he didn't just reach in his back pocket, grab his whip, and just start going, you know. He's, he intends to do this. Right, right. So he pours out the coins of the money changers. He overturns their tables. Um, he sends away those who sold the pigeons. The old is giving way to the new. Now, part of the old is the temple itself. The temple itself is, it's David's idea, although the Lord had planned for it. It's executed by Solomon, but with God's blessing. But that blessing, remember, always has that conditional if attached to it. In a way that the, the, the covenant with Abram does not. God's covenant with Abram does not have the word if. His covenant with Solomon does. If you stay faithful, this will remain. Spoiler, it didn't. They rebuilt the temple. And then Herod kind of re-rebuilds it, refurnishes it, how, whatever it is that he does. That's where we are here. This is Herod's temple. And so the sacrifices are commanded by God. You'll find them in Leviticus 1 through 3. You'll find instructions all throughout the books of Moses. But a lot also that's going on is abusive. Both that which has been commanded by God and the abuses will pass away. And we know this because of the next verses. Turn to verse 8. No, Herod rebuilt the temple. Yes, John 2.18. This is the first encounter that we're going to see outright in an adversarial way uh, between Jesus and the Jews. This is going to be a repeating theme all throughout John's gospel, where Jesus will come to a place, he'll teach, he'll do something, and then here come the Jews, and they're opposing him either with words or they're trying to kill him. That will persist until they succeed in, in, in the end of the gospel. Yes? So what does that mean, zeal for your house will consume What does it mean, zeal for, the or zeal for my father's house will consume me? Um, he... he it's his, his desire will be that his father's house be set right. And that will, that will consume him. That is to say, it will, it will cause him to act. John 2.18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Now, what did Paul say about Jews and signs? Jews seek after signs, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness for the Gentile. So Paul says that, and, and here, here they are demanding a sign. Now, to be fair, that request may not be entirely sinful. You know, what, what proof do you have that you have the authority to do this? And this is how Jesus answered, verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So, Jews demand a sign, and Jesus says, this will be your sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, in their mind, what they're thinking is, destroy this building, this complex of buildings behind us, and in three days he will rebuild by stacking stones and regilding everything. And that's going to be the miracle that will, that will signify this. But again, that's merely fixing what was old. 
that's fixing that which was passing away. The temple would, at a time appointed by God, give way to worship in a, of, of a, new, in a new temple, right? And the temple is the place where sacrifices are made and where God dwells with his people. And what did John tell us at the beginning of the gospel? And the word was made flesh and dwelt, and we talked about that word dwelt, could be tabernacled among us. The new temple is the body of Jesus. His, his physical body. That's to be the new temple. This is where God dwells with man now. He's in the body of Jesus Christ. It's an interesting question. The, the, the Greek word that he uses for temple is a little ambiguous. It could mean something broader than simply the, the inner building, right? It could even include like, like the temple precincts around the temple. Um, destroy this dwelling place, and in three days I will rebuild it. They are only able to conceive of God dwelling with man in the building. And so for them, that's the idea. We're going to see the same thing in Nicodemus, right? Where Jesus uses a word that has two different meanings, and Nicodemus is going to take it the wrong way, and Jesus is going to teach him the right way. Uh, that's going to come up in the next chapter. Um, and this is also why we have this clarification that um, what he's talking about is his body. That's to be the sign. Later on, they're going to demand a sign, and he says, you will get no sign but the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah, of course, being a man dying and rising again from the dead. Well, even the disciples don't understand it until after, after the resurrection. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're, we're not that different from the Jews in this, where we come across things all the time that, that have a meaning that we just miss. That's why we study the Bible more than once. Because the more times we do this, the more often we do this, the, the more dedication we, we do when we study the Bible, we'll find more. But like the disciples, like the Jews, um, we might miss it at first. Or it might be that only later, when we learn some other thing, does the first thing become clear. You know, for example, after the resurrection, oh wait, so God is dwelling with man in the body of Jesus. The Jews destroyed Jesus' body, and then he was raised up on the third day. You know, you, you can see them working backward through this. You know, it, it, it would be a lot more obvious after the resurrection than than at that time. Notice, by the way, in verse 22, when the disciples believe, they believe in his word. That is, the word of Jesus is the object of their faith. They hold on to his word. That's, that's an example for us, too. We, we do believe in Jesus, but specifically we believe in his word, that his word is true. So it's, it's not just about having good feelings about Jesus. It's about, one, you got to know his word, but then two, you, you hold on to them, you treasure them. And so they, they believe in his word, now having understood what he was saying. Verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when, he saw, when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. People see what Jesus is doing, they see the signs, and they come to believe in his name. And like we're told at the beginning of the gospel, he came into his own, his own did not receive him, but to those who did receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Right. So they, they believed in his name. So what does it mean then in verse 24? That Jesus did not entrust himself to them. So who does Jesus trust in? The Father, right? He trusts in God the Father. No, 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 no. I, I don't think that at all. No, I think it is important. Um, I've made this point in the creed 
because in the in the Greek in the in the, the Nicene Creed, uh, we say in English that um, you know we, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, but in the Greek it it says I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church, meaning one. I believe that the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church exists, and two, I believe what the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church teaches. Un right, I mean, rightly understood. Right, Catholic meaning you know universal, um, and uh, and here they believe in his name. You can you can believe someone. You know, someone tells you that they saw something. I believe you. In other words, I, I, I think you're telling the truth. That's part of it. Believing in is, is I think, deeper. They're trusting in him. Because this is, this is juxtaposed with Jesus entrusting himself to the Father. They're believing in him. He's not believing in them. <laughs> this is actually good news because it means Jesus is not a fool. Right. Jesus does not believe in, in the people around him for a couple things. First of all, we know what's going to happen by the time that, that he's there with Pilate and with Caiaphas. The crowds are going to be calling for Barabbas. They're fickle. Always have been, by the way. And this is, what, this is not just unique to these people. It's not that group of people around him at that time happened to be the kind of people you couldn't trust in. John makes it very clear. He knew all people. This is a universal. No one needed to bear witness about man to him because he knows man. I mean, that's the whole reason he's among us is because he knows us well enough to know we need a savior. In other words, not just someone to teach about this is the way that you can be saved. It doesn't work for a lot of reasons. One, we're, even if we were to give our lives that's not, we couldn't atone for our own death. We're not without blemish. But also, he knows we're fickle. This is a confession of original sin. He knows what's in mankind, so he doesn't trust them. He trusts his Father. That's also an example for us, though, isn't it? Whom should we trust? Not men, but God. Right? Psalm 146, put not your trust in man, put not your trust in princes. Right. Anything else on the text? So next week we'll pick up the Nicodemus discourse and we'll have more old giving way to new. Uh, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.